Recording. This is Jim Shooter, uh, editor in chief of Marvel Comics. Tell, introduce yourself. Tell us more about yourself. Uh, yeah. He's the original child prodigy. <laughs> <laughs> I started writing for DC Comics when I was 13. They didn't know how old I was. I just was sending stuff in through the mail. I, was, I lived 400 miles away. And uh, after I sent them a few things, they, they bought them. <laughs> And then I started writing regularly. I did all the Superman, Superboy titles. Superman, Superboy, Action Comics, World's Finest, Jimmy Olsen. My main monthly book that I did every month was Adventure Comics featuring uh, Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes. I did that for five years and then I worked, went to Marvel. And I was there for 12 years. Two years I was editor and 10 years editor in chief. And then I started several companies, and that, anyway, it all adds up to 57 years in the business. That's wow. how I remember you as the editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics, uh, overseeing the bullpen bull bulletin. Yep. Tell me, which artists actually worked in the bullpen? Because I hear a lot of them work from home. Uh, none of them work in the bullpen. None of them work The Marvel bullpen, bullpen is fictional. Is it? I mean, it? The only place I know that had a bullpen was me at Valiant. Because I, I had a bunch of young cartoonists, and I had to make them come in so I could look over their shoulder and tell them what to do. Yeah. Um, in the other place, that, there was a, a company that was down in uh, Florida, someplace that called CrossGen. And they actually got all the people together to work in it. That was here in Florida, right? Yeah, I think so. And, uh, but uh, the Marvel Wolfen. What we call the bullpen was actually the production part. So that was all the pay stuff guys and the, and the directions guys, the letterers, all those people sat. And we had an art, an in house production manager. So we know these art production. We oversaw that. He worked for me. His name was Danny Presby, production manager. He was great. Um, but uh, no, most, almost all artists work at home. Occasionally, an artist would come in and he'd uh, find a drawing table somewhere and he'd uh, finish a page or, or draw a cover or something. But that, that was that was unusual. So my big question is this: So the Dark Phoenix or the the, the Death of Phoenix saga was the thing that really wrote me into comics. It sort of hit me in the heart when I was a kid. And I was like, I can't believe this character died, right? And from then on, I was a Chris Claremont like fan, right? Yeah, me too. But Years later, like maybe ten years ago, five years ago, I heard that you were the one that said that Phoenix had to die. Is that true? No, it's no. not. That's the lie Claremont always tells. <laughs> he's a he's a good buddy of mine. But he's a good buddy of mine, but, but but he's been dining out on that story for years. And the fact is, that here's what happened. The way the Phoenix story started is that Chris was stuck for an idea for, for, for a series. And uh, so we, we went out to lunch. Me and Chris and his editor, I think it was Jim Sauer at the time. And uh, so we're batting around, stuff around. And so finally I said to him, I said, you know, Chris, something Marvel's never done. So we've had a lot of bad guys who became good guys. Mm. The Hawkeye, the Black Widow, the Swords, and the world. But we've never had a good guy go bad and stay that way. Mm. He said, don't say another word. He said, I'm going to do this all myself. He said, don't, don't, don't say anything, you know, because <laughs> he wanted to figure out something. Mm. So that's how the Dark Phoenix saga started. And the, the, the original plan was that Dark Phoenix would become evil, and she would be sort of the new Doctor Doom for the X-Men. She would be the mm. you know, uh, nemesis of the X-Men. And that's how it was supposed to end. So uh, Chris, uh, Chris and John started on this, and man, it was intense. It was really good building and building. And uh, before you know it, she destroys a starship with 400 people on it. And then the next thing she does, she burns up a planet that had 5 billion sapient beings on it. And, uh, and I'm thinking, wow, this is getting intense. Because I would read the books before they went to the printer. If I trusted the editor, if I thought the editor was good, I, I didn't interfere before that. I, 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 I guess it was always good. I'd just, you know, read the book, sign it out, and it would go to the printer. Or I'd catch a spelling mistake or something. Yeah. Anyway, uh, uh, so I'm reading it as, it as it's going on to the printer. And anyway, after she blew up the planet, I said, I gotta find out how, you know, how he does the ending. So I went to the editor 
and uh, I think it was Louise at that point. I went to the editor and uh, I said, show me what else you have on this storyline. Well, there were a couple issues that were in progress, like drawn or, or being lettered or whatever. And then there was the final issue, which was still just the plot stage. So I read that stuff and it just got more and more tense, building to some big climax. And in the, in the final issue, the way Chris wrote it, Phoenix just, she gets the Shi'ar fix her mind. Oh, well, she was sick, we'll fix it. And then she goes home and she's, she goes back with the X-Men and she's still Phoenix and she's a superhero. And in other words, all that was for nothing, Chris. And also, I mean, I don't care. I don't care if you were sick that day. You don't just walk away after you blow up a planet and kill 400 people on a starship. I'm sorry, you don't just skate. You know, so yeah. there would be consequences and repercussions. Not the least of which, the families of those 400 people on the starship would be kind of peeved, don't you think? You know? I mean, there would be some consequence. You can't have, oh, I'm better now, and then she just goes home and everything's fine. I was just that's way out of character, because even if she was sick that day, Storm, the champion of life, would never sit beside her at the lunch table again, you know? <laughs> I mean, it, it would change everything. I said, no, Chris, no, she doesn't go back to normal. That's a terrible ending. You've done this great build-up, and now you're copping out. Mm. No. And, and his, he says, well, what do you want? And I said, well, maybe she goes to Galactic Prison or something. He says, I don't like that. The X-Men would keep trying to rescue her. I said, not on my watch, they wouldn't, pal. No way. I said, fine, all right, it's your time. You come up with something. So he comes in the next morning, he stands in my doorway, and he says, I'm going to kill her. <laughs> and I said, deal. You do that right, and that'll be a great ending. Mm. And so, so, so then Chris uh, was arguing. He said, well, well, you can't kill her. And I said, I'm not killing her. You're killing her. <laughs> so we're having this stupid argument. And then he runs out of the room. And the, 10 seconds later, the, the phone rings. I guess he found a phone and he called John Byrne. And then John Byrne calls me. And his first words, not hello, his first words were, are you out of your mind? And I said, no, Claremont and I made a deal, get to work. You know? <laughs> and so, so anyway, they, they kind of had to do it, because, but, but it was, you know, Chris brought it up. And years later, they were doing an X-Men documentary. Somebody was filming it. And they had me there, and they filmed me separately. I mean, they had me one day, and I, I told the story as it happened, what I just told you. And Chris was interviewed, uh, I, I don't know, some, some different time than me, but he was interviewed after me, and it was him and Louise Simonson and Ann Nocenti all sitting on a couch, all being interviewed together. And so they asked him the same question. They wanted to hear his side of the story. And so Chris starts on his, oh, that evil Jim Shooter, he made me kill Phoenix, that, you know. Remember, we're good friends, but he was still, you know, blaming me. Yeah. And, it's, and at one point, as soon as he starts, Louise turns to him and says, Chris, you know it was your idea. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, well, I, you know, and he shuffled around, but then he said, well, I thought if we were going to do it, we'd do it right, and, you know. But, I mean, he admitted on camera that he'd been lying all the time. And uh, he really was his idea, and I just said yes. That's all. You know? So that's that, awesome. That, that's the that Phoenix story. I thought was the greatest, and I thought it was only yeah, really one for years. And then I found out that you were integral to it. I, mean, I was involved. I mean, I, I tried not to be too invasive. I tried to let the guys go as much as I could, especially by great editors like Louise, or Jim Salica, or somebody I really trusted. I tried to leave it up to them. And a lot of things were done not the way I would have done them. But, you know, I didn't want to, you know, clamp down on people. I didn't want to uh, stifle them at all. I wanted them to create. And, then, yeah. and so it was, it was good policy to, to try to not be as, as involved. P.S. That issue, when that issue came out, X-Men was kind of a high middle of the road book. And that issue took it to the top of the charts where it stayed for 20 years. 20 Dang. years. So you must have been doing something right. Man, it must be amazing to be part of that process. Oh, I love this. I'm honored to meet you I'm because that made my childhood. All right. Thanks well, a lot, Jim. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll be back tomorrow and have some stuff to do. Thanks again. All right, thanks. All right. Thank you. No problem.